Father, we praise you this morning. Thank you, Father. We bless you this morning. We praise you and give you honor and give you glory. For this is the day that you've made. And we rejoice and we are glad in it. Thank you, Father, for those landmarks the pastor was talking about. Thank you. They are, they are immovable. Guideposts for our lives. Thank you, Father, for the teaching on the Holy Spirit today. Now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight so that everything that I say and do this morning brings honor and glory unto Jesus. I thank you and praise you. Satan, take your hands off of us. We don't belong to you. We belong to God. We were paid for by the shed blood of Jesus. And so we'll glorify God in every area of our lives. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Give a shout of praise unto the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Glory be to the Lord. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. I've got a, a little story to tell you this morning. Um, it was back in the early 1980s when Pastor Nancy Dufresne uh, was Miss Oklahoma and was a student at the University in Tulsa that I first got to know her. And, um, and then when she and, uh, and Dr. Dufresne married, um, with all of that, uh, all that went on at that time, <laughs> um, I guess that's the nicest way I know how to say it, uh, all the mess that, that, uh, that came against them, um, we got to know them and knew them all through the years, but we lost touch. They began pastoring in California. I, I, I knew they were in California, but I didn't know exactly where they were. And we lost touch until about two years ago. And I was preaching at uh, Kenneth Copeland's annual ministers conference, which I do every year. And um, uh, we made contact again. She was there. And she invited me to come and to speak at their Fresh Oil Fellowship ministers meeting in January two years ago. And I began to meet a number of pastors across the country that are part of that fellowship. And that's how I got this invitation to come here. And uh, there's something very special, um, something very special about this group of ministers that are part of this fellowship. Um, something very special about your churches. I've been now in, in five or six of the churches across the country. And it's not, it's not rele relegated to what part of the country, because I've been in the Midwest and the South, I've been in the West, and, uh, and I'm probably going to go up to some in New York as well. But, uh, but there's, a, there's a commonality. Uh, there is a special camaraderie in the Spirit. Uh, there's something happening in this, in this particular group of churches, in this fellowship. Um, your worship is so powerful. And you sing songs that you can actually sing. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, uh, you know, and, and you're not performing. You know, sometimes, sometimes in life something needs to be said. And, and sometimes somebody from the outside can come and say things that somebody else at home might not be able to get away with, okay? But see, I'm here, and I'm going to leave, so I'll be, I'll be all right. Uh, but I get so tired of going places that I have to dig myself out of a hole when I get up to preach. You know, I get so tired of going places where, they're, where, where it's a performance, and the words of the songs don't have any meaning, and they don't even rhyme. You, you look like you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, and, and it's a performance, and, and when it's all over, you want to say, you know, it's so dead. You want to say, when do we view the body? <laughs> <laughs> but in this group of churches that are part of this Fresh Oil Fellowship, it's not that way at all. You have something to build on when you get up there. You could have gone ahead and preached for the next half hour as far as I'm concerned. You're doing, in fact, you want to come up now and start preaching. I'm, I'm happy with that. I'm not in any hurry. 
But thank you. Thank you for this invitation. I appreciate it. I got to know Pastor Jay and Debbie out in California at, at these conferences. And uh, it's been such a blessing to me. That's where I, I met you, is, in, is out in, in, in California. And I thank God for that. So I appreciate it. I felt like something ought to be said this morning about that. So, and, uh, and to get a group of people on a Monday morning to come out, now that's, you know, that's in the working of miracles category. <laughs> Oh, praise God. I heard this story about this man who fell out of a 20-story window. And as he was falling, he began to pray. <laughs> Lord, help me. And as he fell, he saw a few floors below a flagpole sticking out. And he grabbed it. And it broke his fall, and he, he held on, and he was just holding on, but his fingers were beginning to get really tired. And he began to pray, Lord, help me. And the Lord spoke to him. He said, do you believe that I delivered Daniel from the lion's den? Oh, yes, Lord. <laughs> I believe. Well, do you believe that I delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of Nebuchadnezzar's burning fiery furnace? Oh, yes, Lord, I believe. The Lord said, then turn loose. The man said, now look here, Lord. <laughs> I got myself into this mess. I'll get myself out. <laughs> now that's the story of a lot of Christians. They want to pray until they get direction. And then when they get some direction, suddenly they want to do it their own way. I was in a city up north uh, preaching, and we were driving to the service, and there was a street sign that said, this way. And I thought, well, that's an unusual uh, name for a street. <laughs> and we drove on, and the next block, the next street was called that way. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's pretty strange. But the next street was called his way. Oh. And I thought, well, isn't that amazing? Because I've been this way in my life, <laughs> and I've been that way in my life. <laughs> now I'm trying his way. <laughs> sure works a lot better. You know, when my, my part is not the work, my part is the trust and believing. And that's, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. Now, yesterday morning and last night, we talked a lot about healing. And this morning, I, I feel particularly led to, to continue on this series and to go on to the Holy Spirit. Yes. As I shared with you yesterday morning, if you were here, uh, the Lord gave me three specific topics for the rest of my life. One, healing. Two, the Holy Spirit. Three, seed faith. And um, so we're starting on the Holy Spirit this morning and probably tonight as well. The, the different facets of the Holy Spirit. And today I want to talk particularly about uh, the Holy Spirit in you. Now, I may, I may deal with the gifts of the Spirit tonight, but not particularly today. Today I particularly want to deal with praying in tongues, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, praying in the Spirit, however you want to t title it. I don't really care what title you put on it, uh, but uh, the experience and the benefit I'm the type of person that I, I, I don't want to do something unless I know there's a benefit in it. There's got to be something in it for us. Or why would we do it? You know, we, we plant seed because there's benefit. Because we not only are a blessing, but the blessing comes back to us. So there's got to be some benefit to us as Christians. Or else why are we a Christian? So open your Bibles this morning over to Romans Romans chapter 8. And let me read a couple of passages here from Romans 8 and from 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, beginning at verse 26 in Romans 8. Likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. Now that word infirmities is not a reference to sickness. It is a reference to weakness. Likewise, the Spirit 
also helpeth our weaknesses. For we know not what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now let's uh, pause there for a moment. It is a, it's, it's a shame that the translators in the King James Version use the word itself. The translation should have been himself. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is a person. The third person of the Holy Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God represents himself in three, he, in three forms. He's one God. Now, there are some who believe we Christians are serving three gods. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No, we're serving one God, but he expresses himself in three forms. First as a loving father, second as the son, and third as the Holy Spirit, the divine paraclete. And it's the same with water. You take water and you boil it and it becomes a gas or a vapor. You freeze it and it becomes a solid. You put it in a glass, pour it in a glass, and it's liquid. You can drink it, but it's still water. Okay. So it's the same thing. Okay. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities or our weaknesses for we know not, we don't know what to pray for as we ought. How many times have we all faced that in our lives? When we prayed but we didn't know what to pray for and we use every spiritual religious word we can think of. O oh God, O oh stained glass window, O oh Bible. <laughs> Trying to get through. Some of you said that earlier today. Uh, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Or in other words, for which there is no equivalent in human speech. The groanings deep down inside of you for which you don't have, you don't have the words to say. That's what he's saying here. And he, that is the Holy Spirit, that searcheth the hearts, knoweth what is the mind, and we could add, and will, of the Spirit. Because he, the Holy Spirit, maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now turn over to 1 Corinthians 14, a great chapter on the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, and look at verse 2. For he, now he's talking about a person now, a human being. God bless you. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. So we know when we pray in tongues, we are not praying to men. We are praying to God. But we don't know what we're saying. Okay? We feel good. If you read on down, you'll find, uh, uh, verse 6 or 7 down there, you'll, you'll find that the person who prays in tongues edifies himself. You, you're edified. You, you feel better. But you don't have any understanding to go with it. And you've got to get understanding. What are you with knowledge if you don't know what to do with the knowledge? Okay, so now, now, now switch over to verse 13. And notice the difference. Wherefore, let him, that's he's talking about us now, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. When Paul made this statement, he is not talking about the operation of the gifts of of the Spirit. And this is, this, is, this is the place of departure with a lot of Pentecostals over the years. We have not done, and, I, and I'm a classical Pentecostal, that's how I grew up, that's how I was raised. I'm not a denominational Pentecostal, but I'm, I'm Pentecostal in the sense that I'm charismatic. We Pentecostals have not done a good job of explaining what we mean. We've used some terminology that has been highly misunderstood. 
and miscommunicated, not because we were trying to get it wrong. We did not know how to explain things. You know, we didn't, we didn't understand. We didn't understand exactly how to say what we felt in our hearts. Our hearts were pure. Our hearts were right. But, but the words that came out were misunderstood. And there's still much misunderstanding in the body of Christ today. That's one reason why the evangelical world oftentimes thinks that we Pentecostals are heretics. Because in most cases, they know the Bible far better than we do. Okay? And, and they know that there is a difference between the gifts of the Spirit and your daily devotional prayer language. So therefore, when, when I was growing up and I heard somebody say, when did you get the Holy Ghost? That was a bad that was a bad thing to say. They didn't realize they were, they were saying it wrong. They didn't realize really what they were saying. They were saying that there was, there was something out there beyond their salvation at which, they, at which time they got the Holy Ghost. And I, we'll get back to that, okay? Because if you, if, you, uh, if you allow me to put this microphone back. Um, uh, what was I saying? I was saying something that was immortal. I can just remember. What, what, what was it? I was saying something about the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah, okay, okay, anyway. It'll come back to me. Uh, anyway, let's, let's, let's move on here. Uh, and here, here's, here, here's what I'm headed to in verse 14. Now he's going to talk about himself. Notice the change here. He uses the word I. For if I... Now this is the departure line right here. This is where Paul goes away from talking about the gifts of the Spirit, which he's talked about in, in chapter 12. The gift of the word of knowledge, the gift of, uh, the gift of wi uh, word of wisdom, the, the gift of faith, the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, the gift of interpretation of tongues, the discerning of spirits, the working of miracles, the gifts of healings. There are nine gifts of the Spirit, which Paul outlines in chapter 12. That is not what he's talking about here. Okay? He's not talking about a gift of tongues. Therefore, when someone, as I grew up, would say, when did you get the gift of tongues? Well, let me tell you when you got it. You never did. But it's impossible for a human being to have the gift of tongues. Those gifts are sovereign. 1 Corinthians 12 describes those gifts. They belong to the Holy Spirit. And they are manifested at the Spirit's will and in His timing. Those gifts can flow through any Christian, but only when the Holy Spirit decides. However, the difference is, and the departure that Paul makes here, is that we have the right to pray in tongues every day of our lives, any time we want to. That's what we haven't made clear. And that's what I want to help you with today, because you more than likely uh, have or will deal with people who don't understand this. So I want to make a deposit into you today uh, to help you to help those people. Amen. And it just might help you too. <laughs> okay? So let's, let's, let's read on now. For if I, notice the word I, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Well, that goes back to what he said earlier. Because we're not speaking to men, we're speaking to God. We're praying the mysteries of God. We're praying in tongues, we feel better, we're edified, but we don't have any idea what we're saying. Okay? What is it then? Or in other words, what will I do? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. Okay, now, I'm, I'm, once again, I've got to build this superstructure. Uh, this is this is this is this the way I, I was trained. This is my understanding that you have to build a foundation for people to understand where you're coming from before you get into the the personal anecdotes and stories that help that help to 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 fill out the message. Um, it was back in the early 1960s. I was. Uh, 14, 13, 14 years old. And uh, we had a, a summer home in Southern California. Um, 
my father would base his ministry on the west coast in the summer and the fall and travel from there and um, he used that time to write books and to to prepare for the for the upcoming year and so uh, we would we would go out there on the, around the 4th of July and we would stay until Thanksgiving and I would go half a year to school in California and then at Thanksgiving I would come back to Oklahoma and I would finish the rest of the year there so I would two schools a year for many many years I was a kind of a transplant and it was there it was there that the Lord revealed to my father that it was time to build a university now God had spoken to him in the back seat of the car I gave you the, the testimony yesterday I left part of it out on purpose I shared with you yesterday morning that when he was in the back seat of that car on the way to the healing meeting in 1930, 1935, that the Lord spoke to him and said, Son, I am going to heal you, and you're to take my healing power to your generation. What the Lord also said to him is, And you will build me a university, and you will build it on my authority, and you will build it on the Holy Spirit. That was the rest of what he said, and I saved that for today. So now, all those years had passed. And it's now in the early 1960s, and the time had come to build the university. And my father had a problem. He did not know how to build a university. Now, it's, it's, it's really interesting when the Lord says to you, do something, and you don't have any idea what to do. Some of you are candidates for that. You, you know what I'm talking about. The Lord has told you to do something, and you don't have a clue. I mean, you're clueless of how to do it. And uh, he had no land. He had no money. He had no buildings. He had no faculty. He had no curriculum. He had no students. All he had was a word from God. Build me a university. Build it on my authority. Build it on the Holy Spirit. And then he added these words, raise up your students to hear my voice and to go where my light is seen dim, my voice is heard small, my power is not known, even to the uttermost bounds of the earth, and their work will exceed yours. And in that I'm well pleased. That's all that he had. He had no know-how, and he did not have a completed college education himself. He had quit college uh, in the second or third year in order to pastor. So we're out in California uh, during, during those, those years and um, he began an intense study on the Holy Spirit. I was not involved in it with the exception that whenever I would pass through the living room he would say, come here Richard, I want to test something out on you. <laughs> I was an unwilling observer. I wasn't interested in anything he was talking about, but because he was my dad, he would sit me down and I would hear this, not realizing that even in those years of not being a Christian, it was getting inside me, okay? So I'm learning without trying to learn, okay? Train up a child in the way they shall go, and when they're older, they'll not depart from it. So is it okay if I just give you all this background so you understand where I'm coming from, okay? Because, you know, I may not pass this way again. I don't know. I'm not in charge of that agenda. God's in charge of that. So I better give you everything I got while I'm here. As the fellow said, I give you permission to just milk me dry. Okay? I was raised on a farm, so I can say that. Uh, so he got a hold of a, one of our friends who pastored, and I was telling Pastor Jay about this this morning, who pastored out there, a man by the name of Ralph Wilkerson, precious man of God, still living, he's in his, he's in his late 90s now, and uh, Ralph pastored a great church out there called Melody Land Christian Center, right across the street from Disneyland for many, many years. And Ralph, in my father's opinion, was the most balanced concerning the Holy Spirit. And uh, my father was always a person of balance, taught me to be balanced. And so, for months, every day, Ralph, Pastor Ralph would come to our home and they would sit there in our living room overlooking the ocean. 
and talk about the Holy Spirit and go over scripture after scripture after scripture because my father had a mandate and he did not know how to do it. So now after all those months we come back to Tulsa and uh, he found a, a piece of land south of, of, of the city now part of the city over these years and he knew that was the place. He had been offered land in California by the University of the California system, but he wanted to build it elsewhere. So there was a farm on this land with producing oil wells and horses and cattle, and uh, for months he tried to get the man to sell, and the man would not sell. But he knew that was the piece of land. And so our attorney would go out there repeatedly. Uh, Saul Yeager, a Jewish man, was our attorney, former judge in the city. And he would go out there time after time trying to buy the land. The man wouldn't sell. And my dad was praying one night, and the Lord spoke to him and said, go one more time. So the next day, he sent our attorney out there again, and Mr. Yeager knocked on the door. Of course, the man knew who he was. He'd been out there a dozen times. And he said to our attorney, I'm so glad you're here. We decided to sell last night. Family got together. We decided to sell the whole piece of land. And then, of course, he asked the $1,000 question, how much do you want? And the man said, well, I only want a small down payment, and you can pay it out over the years. It'll be easier on my taxes that way. Of course, that was music to my dad's ears, because he didn't have one dollar to begin with. Not one dollar to buy it. But he had a, a promise from the man that he would sell it. So he was able to make a very, very small down payment on the land. Now, move forward now over the next few weeks. Uh, we would take my bicycle and put it in the trunk of the car, and we would drive about half an hour out there to that piece of land. Uh, by now, the family had moved out, and uh, the houses remained, and the barns and everything still remained, and a couple of working oil wells uh, were, were still working. And he and I, my father and I, would walk among the trees. I'd ride my bicycle. I was out there riding my bicycle. He was walking through the trees, praying, God, how? How do I do this? This is the land you wanted me to have. You've made it possible. Now, I don't have any idea. I have no idea how to do what you've told me to do. When the Lord spoke to him, I said, Earl Roberts, do you have the Holy Spirit? He said, well, sure, of course. And then the Lord said to him, do you know who you have? Well, the mere fact that the Lord would say to him, do you know who you have? must have meant that he didn't know who he had. Do you know who you have? And so he replied, I guess not. And the Lord said, you have the unlimited power of God at your disposal. I do. And the Lord said to him, do you pray in tongues? And my father said, Yes, occasionally. He prayed in tongues the way most Pentecostals in those days prayed in tongues. They got what they called initial evidence. They had a one-time experience where they burst into tongues feeling that they had arrived and they never did it again except in times of great joy or great distress. I see some people nodding their heads. You know what I'm talking about. Because that may be the only time that you pray in tongues. Great times of joy, great times of distress. And the Lord encouraged him to begin praying in tongues. And he reminded him of the scripture that I read in Romans 8. That when a person is born again, the Holy Spirit comes in and takes up, res takes up residence in their hearts. So when someone says, when did you get the Holy Ghost? Well, you could be honest and say, I got the Holy Ghost when I got saved. Because the Holy Spirit came in and bore witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. That happened the day I got saved. I don't have to go get him again because I've already got him. And I, you hear the old, old time Pentecostal say, well, when did you get the Holy Ghost? When I got saved. 
I didn't have to tarry. I didn't have to roll around on the floor and wait. I didn't have to get consecrated first. A person who gets saved has the Holy Spirit instantaneously and could begin to pray in tongues at any moment. But we were taught that you had to wait. You had to tarry. Which was misunderstood because on the day of Pentecost, the Lord told them to tarry. But He told them to tarry because the Holy Spirit had not yet been poured out. Well, now He's been poured out. So we don't have to tarry. You don't have to wait. You don't have to roll around on the floor. You know, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to hold on, let go. <laughs> All these t- Pentecostal terminology words that we... How do you pray and tell? Well, hold on or turn loose. <laughs> I'm talking about, I'm talking about 50, 60 years that, that, that I, I've known about this. Almost you know, at least 60 years. And all, all, all this well-meaning people, okay? Not trying to get something wrong. And the Lord said to him, I want you to begin praying in tongues. Well, as I said, he had only prayed in tongues in times of great joy or great distress as a general rule after that first time of praying in tongues when he was a young man. And he began to study what the Lord said in the Scripture, that the Holy Spirit comes in and bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. And remember I said earlier that's a mistranslation of the word it. The Spirit is not an it, he's a person. Well, a person talks. The Holy Spirit then is in us, came in when we were born again, well, it begs the question, if he's in us, what's he doing? He's interceding. The Bible tells us he makes intercession for the saints. Who are the saints? That's us. What's he doing? He's reaching down into the innermost part of your being and my being. And he's going down into the area for which we have no equivalent in human speech. He's taking our deepest, innermost feelings and taking them in a straight line prayer up to God he not only knows us but he knows the mind and will of the father and we by an act of our will because Paul said I will pray in the spirit and I will pray and the word will in the Greek is determine I determine I'm going to pray in tongues and I'm going to pray with the understanding also. And because he did what I'm about to describe, it totally changed his life. He began to pray in tongues and tap into the prayer of the Holy Spirit, who was praying seven days a week, 24 hours a day, in a direct line prayer to God. He joined in that prayer. And after he prayed in tongues, he stopped and he began to pray out loud in English. And as he prayed out loud in English, God gave words to him that did not come from his mind. Words that came from his spirit. Paul said, what will I do? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding. Or in other words, I will pray in my own language. Excuse me, I will pray in tongues. I'll give words in the spirit which I don't understand. And then I will stop and begin to pray in my own language and God will give me new ideas new concepts, new innovations, and new and innovative ways of doing things. He literally fell into it. He began praying in tongues and praying in his own understanding. And as he did, it was like a huge light bulb was turned on. Suddenly, and if he were here today, he would confirm what I'm telling you. He said, suddenly, son, suddenly, in the flash of a second, I knew how to build a university. I knew how to get the land, which he had already paid down on. I knew how to get the money. I knew how to build the buildings, and he wasn't an architect. I knew how to get students. I knew how to get faculty. I knew how to do it in the flash of a second by praying in tongues and stopping and praying in his own language. And he came home, back to our house. We went back to our house. 
and uh, my mother would hear him in the bedroom or in the, in the bathroom praying in tongues and my mother would begin to say Oral you have always been so balanced but you have gone off the deep end because <laughs> she was raised as a classical Pentecostal also and he began to explain to her what I have explained to you pretty soon she was praying in tongues and praying in her understanding as well and that began to bleed over into us as children and it transformed my father's life and the proof is that he was able to do what the Lord told him to do and I know it's true because I graduated three times from there I got my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, and I got a, earned a doctorate degree. And I served in many capacities, including I served as president for 15 years. So I know what I'm talking about. Because it happened. When you pray in tongues, you're not speaking to, to men. You're speaking to God. But you don't understand what you're saying. But after you pray in tongues, if you'll stop and begin to pray in your own language, you'll be shocked what will come out of your mouth. Now, move forward some, some number of years. Now I'm up, I'm, I'm up in uh, my college years now. And I've come back home, and I've given my heart to the Lord. And that evening, uh, there was a group of guys where I lived who were having a prayer meeting. And they had invited me many times, because I lived near them, they invited me to come to their prayer meeting, but I wasn't interested, because I wasn't a Christian. But that afternoon, I had given my heart to the Lord. Suddenly, I wanted the things of God. That night was the night they were having a prayer meeting. And I heard them. I heard them praying. I heard them speaking in, in a language which was not English. And so I knocked on their door, and I said to them, what are you doing? Well, I knew what they were doing. I'd been raised in it. I'd, I'd heard all my life, but I'd never participated in it myself. So they said, we're praying in tongues. Would you like to join us? I said, I don't know how. They said, well, come on in, and we'll help you. And I said, what do I do? Now, I'm, I'm 19. I'm two weeks before my 20th birthday and they said start with us what do you mean start with you start with us say what we say and I said well now and I'm not going to parrot anybody I'm not going to mimic you no if this is real it's not going to be me mimicking you they said no 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 start with us and let us prime your pump Suddenly I remembered. I was raised on a farm. We had an old water pump on our farm. And there always was a little cup of water. And you had to pour a little water in to pump to get a lot of water out. Suddenly it dawned on me what they were saying. They were going to use my starting with them like that little cup of water. They were going to prime my pump. They were going to help me to get started in my own prayer language. They said, if you'll start with us, the Lord will take you on into your own prayer language, which will be different than ours. And I knew what they were talking about. They said, you start with us, say what we say, and let the Lord just take you on into your own language. I said, okay. And we started together. And I started saying what they were saying. But it wasn't more than a few seconds until the syllables coming out of my mouth were different than what they were saying. I had no idea what I was saying because the Bible says I don't have any idea what I'm saying. Suddenly I felt better. I, I felt that edification that the Bible talked about in 1 Corinthians 14. I felt, I felt good. I, I felt something coming up in me. I felt It felt wonderful, but I didn't have any information to go along with it. So it was just a feeling. It was a good feeling, but you got, you got to have more than a good feeling, you know. And then all of a sudden they said, stop, and begin to pray in English. And I did. 
And when I began to pray in English, two or three sentences came out of my mouth that I knew did not come out of my brain. And I said, hey, <laughs> hey, that's pretty good. And they said, do it again. And so we started praying again. This time, a few more syllables in tongues came out of my mouth. Well, I was not fluent. There was no fluency at all. Just a few words. Because in order to, 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 to speak a language, you have to speak it often in order for it to become fluent. Right. So I just got a few, a few syllables. And the next time I prayed in tongues, there were a few more syllables. Yeah. And the more I prayed in tongues, a few more syllables came. Yes. And then I would stop and I would pray in English. And all of a sudden, ideas and insights and concepts began to come into my mind. And God began to say through my own mouth, what I was supposed to do with my life. And suddenly I began to see all that I had experienced just as an observer in my younger years through my father. And I began to understand what he went through in building the school and how the Holy Spirit allowed him and showed him how to do all these things. Suddenly I was experiencing it myself. And I, 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 I felt like I could fly. And I learned that I could pray in tongues any time I wanted to. I didn't have to wait until I was happy. I didn't have to wait until I was sad. I could just pray at any time. I, at the drop of a hat, I could just start praying in tongues, and I could, then I could stop and pray in English. Because remember, Paul said, I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding. In other words, you can turn it on, you can turn it off. It is not an emotional experience in itself. Amen. Now you certainly feel emotion. But it is not an emotional experience in itself. You can stop it and you can start it. Just like you can take the faucet in your bathroom and turn it on. And the water will flow. And when you have had enough water, you turn it off. It's under your control. In other words. In other words, you don't have to do what I, I saw as I grew up, which turned me off. I saw people interrupting services, rolling around the floor, praying in tongues for two hours, which totally out of, out of, out of, out of line. And that's one of the things that turned me off when I was a boy in church, because I saw a lot of people doing a lot of stupid things. Okay? Do you know anybody that's stupid? I mean, look straight ahead. Don't look right or left. Years passed, and I went through all kinds of stuff. And um, when I was 30, 31, uh, Lindsay and I got married. But during those years, I, I fell back into what uh, I had seen, and I became a victim of it. Um, I didn't pray in tongues uh, on a regular basis. I, I let it wane in my life, and I went back to what I had seen as a boy. And if you're not careful, that's what happens to you. I didn't pray in tongues much anymore. Only when I was real happy or when I was real sad. And uh, I knew that God was going to use me in the healing ministry, but I didn't know when, didn't know how. So Lindsay and I get married. And uh, she had, uh, well, I need to back up and tell you another story. Um, uh, you know, Kenneth Copeland can keep four stories going at the same time. I'm not going to be outdone. Um, I have to back up at this point, okay? We're, we're rem remembering me. Put a, pa put a paper clip right there, okay? Remember when I say, what was I talking about? Remember say, you just got married, okay? Yeah. Me remember to tell me that. So I need to tell you this story because pastor said to me last night, you need to tell the story. So here's a good place to tell it. Um, uh, Lindsay and I had had, uh, uh, I told you yesterday, I believe I told you, didn't I, about, about how we had, how uh, her mother had become a partner yeah. after, her, after her father died. Well, the rest of the story is uh, she came to law school to be a law student, and uh, that's where we met. And a friend of mine had known her and said, there's a real pretty uh, Lebanese girl I want you to meet. Her dad is full-blood Lebanese. Her mother was Danish, so she was half Dane, half Lebanese. And uh, she had come to go to law school, and... Uh, my friend introduced me after a service among all the students where I had preached. And I had preached a message on uh, David and Goliath on cutting off the giant's head. 
and I said, we're going to symbolically, we're going to cut the giant's head off of whatever it is that's coming against you. It may be spiritual, it may be physical, it may be financial, maybe some other area of your life. We're going to cut that giant's head off tonight, okay? Uh, and so I'd preached that message, and we'd had a wonderful time of prayer. And afterwards, my friend introduced me to her. And uh, she said, I enjoyed your message. And I said, well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I said to her, what part did you enjoy? She said, the part about cutting off the giant's head. <laughs> well, okay. I said, well, that's fine. Uh, and, and so I innocently said to her, what is your biggest giant? She said, you. Now, you need to know, I had been single for about a year. And I had planned to stay single forever. I was done with women. She said I was her biggest giant. How could I be her biggest giant? I had never met her. I'd never seen her before. Had no idea who she was. How could I be her biggest giant. What kind of nut have you introduced me to? <laughs> You've all had some experience like that when uh, you just, just want to just say, well, thank God. <laughs> and it ended right there. And uh, when I got home that night, I said, what was that? I couldn't get it off my mind. How could I be her biggest giant? And so I let a day, couple of days go by, and I got her phone number. And I called her. And I said, I, I don't understand. How can I be your biggest giant? I've never met you before in my life. She said, well, the truth is, um, and she began to tell the story about how my dad had prayed for her dad. And she said how her mother had, had prayed and how she wanted to go to law school, but her mother wouldn't let her go anywhere else. And she said, uh, I didn't want to come here in the first place. And she said, I had no idea that uh, Oral Roberts had a son in the first place. And as I was coming here, the Lord began to speak to me about you, and I told the Lord to cut it out. <laughs> and I wasn't interested in whoever he wanted me to have a relationship with. I wanted to be a corporate tax attorney, and I was going to come here and get my law degree and go back to Florida where I was living. And uh, well, she was living in Florida at the time. And, and, uh, and become a tax lawyer, and I don't have, she said, I don't have time for you. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't remember inviting you anywhere. <laughs> and uh, so I said, uh, well, Let's have dinner tomorrow night. <laughs> she said, okay. So I didn't want to be with her, and she didn't have time for me. But the next night, I went to pick her up at the apartment where she was living. And uh, she came to the door, her, and her hair, I'll never forget it, her hair was soaking wet. Uh, she had been late, it was late coming from law class, and she had uh, run, she had run three, three or four miles. And she had just gotten out of the shower and gotten dressed, but her hair was still soaking wet, and her hair was all the way down here in this area. And uh, uh, long, beautiful hair. And she said, I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 didn't, I don't have time uh, to get ready. I didn't have time. And so she's, she put her hair up on top of her head. And uh, we got to the restaurant, and I said, what would you say if I said to you, I'd like you to take your hair down? Now, it's still soaking wet in the restaurant. And uh, she said, well, actually, she didn't say anything. She just reached up and just clips out and let it fall and kind of shook her head. Well, <laughs> this might have some possibilities. <laughs> just simply asking her, she takes her hair down, you know. That's kind of a sacred cow to a lot of women. <laughs> and we, uh, we, talked, uh, we talked for several hours. And uh, 16 weeks later, we were married. 
as 39 years ago. And the, the most amazing thing was, uh, after we got married, we, we go to bed at night and we start praying. And she would just launch into tongues and pray in tongues and stop and pray in her own language. And I, I actually said to her, how do you do that? I had forgotten. I had forgotten how to do what I had done years before. I, it, it, it's so far away, I'd forgotten how to do it. And she said, well, let me help you. And she would begin to pray in tongues. And she would say, just join in with me. And I would join in with her, and pretty soon I was praying in tongues again. And I'd stop and begin to pray in English. And she recharged me in the Holy Spirit. And uh, I never had to go back and start over again. All through these years now. Now, I don't pray in tongues because I'm better than anybody else. I pray in tongues because I need help. Paul himself said, we do not know what to pray for as we ought. And we use every English word, and it just seems to bounce off the ceiling and hit us in the face, and we don't know what to say. We don't know what to do in our own language. I'll tell you, in my life, there are times when English just won't cut it. And so as a couple, we, we, every day we'd pray in tongues and stop and pray in our own language. We didn't announce it. We didn't get up and do it publicly. It's not, uh, most of the time when I pray in tongues, it's not in public. It's, it's in my own private devotions. I'm not doing it for show. I'm not doing it to say, look at me, I speak in tongues. No, that's not what I'm doing. I'm trying to get help. And a few years after, uh, a few years after uh, we were married, we were trying to have children, and she had been told by her doctor that she would never be able to have children because she had endometriosis. And... Uh, which means you can get pregnant, but you're most likely going to have a miscarriage. And uh, sure enough, uh, she had uh, two or three, um, I always say two, she always says three, uh, miscarriages. And then uh, she got pregnant again and carried a baby full term. And we thought, well, hallelujah, we're going we're to have, have a baby now. And she carried the baby full term and at nine months gave birth to a little boy, beautiful little boy. We named him Richard Oral. And while he was in the hospital with her, uh, developed a breathing problem. And 36 hours later, he died in my arms in the, in the intensive care unit. And we were destroyed. And uh, we got to the memorial service, and I, honestly, I don't know how we got through it. And there was a woman who walked up after the service to Lindsay and me and looked at us and said, I prayed that your baby would die. And I couldn't understand why she would say something like that. And she said, well, because you were divorced and remarried, I prayed your baby would die. You know, and I wanted to just hit her. I didn't, but I wanted to. And I uh, said to Lindsay, you know, imagine imagine the pain she must be going through in something in her life for her to say something that cruel. So we were, we were destroyed. And all we knew how to do was to hold on to one another and pray. And we prayed in tongues. Because our words in English weren't cutting it. And we prayed in tongues. And as we prayed in tongues and stopped and prayed in our, our own language, God began to say things to us in English that began to give us comfort and she had afterwards she looked at me and she said uh, please don't ever ask me to get pregnant again and uh, you know who could blame her she had had miscarriages now the loss of a child who could blame her and I was scheduled to go to Nigeria for crusades in Lagos and in Benin City and in Jos and she was going to be in, at home taking care of a new baby because I was supposed to go two weeks after the baby was due. And we timed it to where uh, she would be home and, and I'd, I'd be in Africa af after the baby was born. And she looked at me and she said, I'm going with you. And I said, honey, you, you can't go. Uh, you've just had a baby. We've, we've just put our baby in the ground and you, you can't go. She said, no, you don't understand. 
My healing is in Africa. But she pointed her finger at me and said, don't ever ask me to get pregnant again. And I, and I said, okay. So we went, to, we went to Nigeria. And at that time, I don't know if it's still true today, but at that time, Nigeria had the, the number one infant mortality rate in the world. More baby, more baby deaths in Nigeria than any place else in the world at that time. And we went to that crusade and preached uh, three days in each city. Many, many miracles, great miracles, including the one I told you about yesterday with the young man who had never walked. It was on that, on that trip. And we ministered to so many couples who had lost children. And when we got back home, she looked at me and she said, let's try one more time. And uh, Jordan is now 34. And Catherine Olivia is now 32. And Chloe Elizabeth, who we call Oral Roberts in a dress, <laughs> is 29. That happened because of praying in tongues and interpreting back. Praying in tongues is a Christian's secret weapon. The world can't do it. The world doesn't have the Holy Spirit, but you do. I do. And the apostle said, stir up the Holy Spirit who is in you. And a lot of us need to be stirred up because we only pray in tongues at times of intense joy or intense sadness. But that's not what it's for. Sure, it's for that time as well, but it's for every day. And as I say, I don't do it to, to, make, to make it look like I'm, uh, I'm somebody special. I was praying in tongues in my room this morning. Nobody heard it. We were singing this morning. I was praying in the Spirit as I was sitting here as you all were singing, just trying to get my, some clearness in my mind of what the Lord wanted me to do today. I don't advertise it. And, and what I'm going to do now, I'm only going to do now because I'm in a closed service like this. Because there are some of you who who are right with me 100% and you're doing exactly what I'm doing but there are some others of you who do not have the fluency and you are now like I was you only do it in times of real happiness or extreme sadness and God has so much more for you so would you stand up for a minute one thing I learned from my father is when there's a message, there needs to be a demonstration. That's the confirmation. Let's all just begin to pray in tongues. And if you've never prayed in tongues before, open your mouth and join in our prayer and let the Holy Spirit take you into your own language. And you won't do it unless you open your mouth. You will not speak unless you are a ventriloquist you'll never speak without opening your mouth that's it just pray in the spirit if you've never prayed in tongues open your mouth and start with us and let the Lord take you into your own language Broso ve ah ah oya nana kasitia stobro kosoti kisindia tana kasabra kasa boshine kisibrea mendo kosobra kasa tana kasiti kistia nda kasambra kasa. Now stop. Remember, it's under the control of your will. You can start and stop at will. Okay, Paul said, "I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also." So you can start and you can stop. It's not an out, of, an out of control experience. Okay? You can stop when you decide to, like you just did. All right, now pray again. Kishta brakasoya sandia. Leto ibrakasata nakasia. Shede kisimbriata nakasoya sanda kashtam brakasa. That's it. Stir up the Holy Spirit who is in you. You don't have to go get him, you already have him. Kobro so diata na kasinda kastambra kasa. Moshe na kasiti ata na kasabra. Istobro kosiya. Now stop. Now begin praying out loud in English. The first word that comes to your mind. 
the very first thing that you hear, start saying in English. Right out loud. Right out loud in English, the very first words, no matter what they sound like, the very first words that come to your mind, say them out loud. Now this is how you start. Now pray in tongues again. That's it. There's some fluency coming now. And the more you practice, the more fluent you become. New words in tongues will come. Even now, after all these years, I get new words in tongues I've never said before. Now stop. Now begin to pray in English again. The first words that come to your mind. The very first words. Say that right out loud. Now, my friends, spirit of faith, I don't know if I can deposit anything more valuable in your life than what I'm depositing this morning. This is a way of life. And I promise you, on the authority of the Word of God, if you will begin to do what you just did, and if you'll do it every day, your fluency will grow. You'll find you can do it anytime you want to. Because he's resident in you at all times. And he is always interceding. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. He's always praying in a straight line prayer to God. Always. And at any time you choose, you can tap in or join in his prayer. And you can pray in tongues, and you can stop and pray in English. Praying in English is just as important as praying in tongues. Because if you don't pray in English, all you have is a feeling. You're edified, you feel better, but you don't have information to go along with it. And in this society in which we live, you have to have information. You have to know what to do. I wouldn't dream of coming someplace without praying in tongues before I walk up to speak because I don't know exactly what God wants me to do. I don't have this big master plan. You know, I don't have 65 pages of notes that I'm going to read. I mean, I, I have some notes, but I, I don't use them very often, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a spontaneous person. And the, 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 the crowd that I'm with will pull out of me what the Holy Spirit wants me to say. So I, I have some notes here, but I, I, haven't, looked, I haven't looked at them yet. <laughs> I looked at them in my room, but I didn't look at them when I got here because I want to flow in the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to be able to give what you need. Amen. And I can't do that if I'm married to everything here. Okay. Now, I'm quite capable of reading the whole thing, you know, but because but <laughs> I did learn how to read as a boy. I, I can read. And that's the problem that I see in a lot of churches today. They're reading it. It's not coming out of their spirit. And I, I think the thing that touches my heart the most with uh, this fellowship of churches of which you're a part is the openness that I feel and the hunger that I feel and the presence and spirit of God. I, I wish I could tell you how refreshing it is. Because if you had been to the places that I have been over all these many years. This is not happening every place. Oh, that it were, but it's not. And I want to thank all of you for allowing me the freedom to just open my heart and share with you the secrets of my life. Praying in tongues is your secret weapon. The world can't do it. Honestly, most Christians are not doing it. They have the ability, but they're not doing it. But you not only can, but you are. Amen. And as you continue, and as you do this every day, it's like a muscle. The more you use a muscle, the more you develop it. You know? 
the stronger you get. And the more you pray in tongues, the more language will flow. And then when you pray in English, it, invariably two things will happen. You'll either be saying in English what you've been wanting to say, and you didn't have the knowledge of how to say it, or you'll be getting his response back to you so that suddenly you know what to do. Amen. So many times in my life when I don't know what to do, I just stop and pray in tongues and understanding comes. I remember I was in, uh, in uh, the largest crusade of my life in Kenya. And the last night there were 200,000 people. And I had been in my hotel room studying and praying and preparing all day. And they called me and said, you better get here quick. A huge crowd. The police said 200,000. I'd never seen a crowd like that in my life. And I'd studied and prayed and I'd prepared. And I got on the platform and the Lord said to me, don't preach that. <laughs> I said, Lord. <laughs> I've studied and prepared all day. He said, well, you needed the study. <laughs> and I said, what do you want me to do? Now, 200,000 people. And he said, well, why don't you start praying in tongues and see what I do? And so I began praying in tongues. I was, all, I was ready to walk on the platform when it happened. And all of a sudden, words began to come out of my mouth in English, and suddenly I knew what he wanted me to do. And it was totally different than what I'd planned. But it was what he planned. And that's what I want. Amen. And that's the value of praying in tongues. Of getting the understanding. I've got to have understanding. Let's pray in tongues one more time. Shiti atanaka simbra kasa. Masho prokosondi asa. Kila masandi ashtam brakasa. Sholo makasati ananaka sambra kasa tanaka shti Praise your Father.